Maybe I can start an email thread with all of you. Um, and, and we can make sure we stay in touch and strategize. So um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start. And I, if you're not talking, if you want to go ahead and mute, because I know there's sometimes a lot of background noise, dogs barking. My dog might bark. I really apologize for that. I was just telling Michael that I have a little tiny dog who's very codependent, who has to sit by me all the time. But then if there's any noise in the house, she'll bark. So I really apologize if there's any barking. But um, OK. So my name is Georgia Davenport and I'm with Whole Washington. I'm the field director for Whole Washington and I'm also the field director for One Pair States. Um, I would like to give an overview of One Pair States first. Um, they're kind of like this umbrella organization that uh, we can organize all the legislation, all the ballot initiatives through because they're a 501c4. So um, it it will be really good to strategize using one pair of states as kind of an umbrella organization. And they've been working in this area for a long time, so there's a lot of knowledge there to pull from um, already, historically. Um, I, I also want to talk a little bit about Whole Washington um, and how we became an organization. In um, 2016, well, 2015 really, I got kind of reactivated <laughs> by a uh, particular candidate, um, Bernie Sanders, and I got really, really into politics. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has that story. Um, but then in 2016, I got really cynical when he wasn't the nominee, and I started looking for an outlet for all this energy I had. I really wanted to make change, not me, us, sort of thing. Um, and I, like I said, was cynical about candidates at that point, and I discovered ballot measures um, as a form of direct democracy. It really appealed to me because you put in a lot of work for a candidate or a campaign, and a lot of the times they're not elected, and sometimes they are elected, and they have a huge, um, it's a huge issue to even try to get what they want passed, um, just because there's so many other elected officials who may not want universal health care or whatever issue that you're working on, um, they'll, it's a hot hill battle for them to get um, like Medicare for all passed. So I thought, well, this ballot measure thing, that's pretty awesome. You know, you just get the signatures. I mean, I'm oversimplifying this obviously. <laughs> it is a lot of work, but you get the signatures required. You make it on the ballot. If the voters choose to approve it, then it's law. You don't have to worry about um, the governor signing it at least in Washington state, the governor doesn't have to sign it into law. Um, and that really appealed to me at that moment in time, being able to do something really um, tangible to create change. So I went to work for Initiative 735, which in Washington state was the initiative to overturn Citizens United. We passed by 64% in 2016, and we kind of were wondering what next. And as many of you might know, uh, health care is not often offered to campaign staff. So it, because it's just really way too expensive. I understand why. Um, so a lot of us had no health insurance or we were underinsured, like my family. So we decided that we wanted to start a universal health care um, 501c4 to get universal health care on the ballot here in Washington state. We spent a year organizing around that, you know, getting our tax exempt status, getting our 501c4 set up, um, you know, that requires writing articles of incorporation, forming a board, um, having bylaws, that sort of thing. And then also during that time, we were writing the initiative and going to different groups around the state, asking them to be part of the process of writing the initiative or organizing around this campaign. Um, and so then, in 2018, we were ready. We filed an initiative to the people and um, with 100% volunteer uh, group, we collected over 100,000 signatures. Now that wasn't enough. We needed 300,000 signatures, but a lot of initiatives do take two times to get the required amount of signatures just because, well, in our group specifically, and a lot of um, grassroots groups, we just didn't have enough money to pay for paid signature gatherers. So a couple other initiatives that um, 
took two times was initiative 735 they did an initiative to the people didn't get enough signatures then they did an initiative to the legislature got on the ballot and passed we had de-escalate washington same thing the first time they didn't get enough signatures the second time they reorganized got enough signatures and passed and they passed last year so um historically it does take a few times if you don't have a lot of money to pay some initiatives are paying a, seven dollars for a signature so that's that's a lot of money which we don't have that kind of money so we were really relying on um, volunteers so we're geared up we got um over 200,000 we have like I think about 200 to 300 volunteers who have pledged already to collect 200,000 signatures um, for our next run and we were planning on doing that this year but because of COVID-19 we decided to delay by a year um, due to the fact that we really rely on large events here in Washington State to collect those signatures, like Folk Life Festival draws hundreds of thousands of people, Pride Parade, the same hundreds of thousands. Without those sort of events, there was little to no chance that we would get the amount of signatures we need because Washington State requires in-person signatures. So for that reason, we paused our campaign. We decided to do a little bit more coalition building, a little bit more volunteer recruitment, fundraising, and gear up for 2021. Which brings us to now. I'm very, very excited by the um, possibility that many people on this very phone call might also be running ballot initiatives, which I've always thought would be the best strategy because if you have five to 10 states all doing it at the same time, there's a chance that that will make it harder for the for-profit insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies to direct all their attention, like they did in Colorado. Elaine can talk about that. Um, Colorado and California, when they did the um, negotiating of pharmaceutical costs, um, you know, the drug companies came in with millions of dollars to defeat that ballot initiative. So I'm really encouraged by the possibility that all of us can work together and run ballot initiatives at the same time. So that was kind of a big overview and I want to get into some of the like more technical aspects of um, a campaign and how we set up our campaign and some of the things that we ran into, roadblocks, some things that you can avoid um, <laughs> by learning from our mistakes. Um, and then I also want to um, open it up for questions after that. I know there's something else going on this evening, which I'm not gonna tune into, but I, some people on this call might wanna tune into. Um, I can't watch debates. I just, even if I love the candidates, I can't do it. I don't know what it is. It's just, I just watched the highlights the next day. Um, but so why a ballot measure? We've had legislation um, in Washington state to get a single payer system for decades. Now we have a lot of legislators in Washington state who actually take money directly from pharmaceutical companies and for, for profit insurance companies. That's allowed in Washington state. So I don't think it's any coincidence that the Democratic chairs of the health care committees, both, both in the Senate and the House, have never let a single payer bill out of committee. It's only had a hearing twice, but they will not let it out of their health care committee. And I've spoken to them both, and they're, they're both pretty much never going to let them out of committee. I mean, I would have to take a lot of pressure, political pressure, and I'm not sure if we, we have that pressure, although we're trying. Um, we, do, we did have a bill in the legislature, and we will have another bill in the legislature this year. Um, so. It's not that we've given up on the legislative process, we're just realistic about the chances of the bill actually making it out of committee and then passing, or being anything similar to what it was originally, because they can change it um, if they want to during that whole process. So that's why whole Washington really focused on the ballot measure. We felt like that was a much more um, viable and realistic route versus um, getting a bill out of committee and passed, and then signed by the governor. So you have to worry about who the governor is. Inslee, 
I'm pretty sure would not pass or sign a universal health care bill. Um, and so, and then, you know, the, the whole waiver issue too um, is, is another aspect that we can talk about. But with Whole Washington, we wanted to make sure that we had a fully well thought out ballot measure with um, a transition plan and the funding in it and that we can pass and it would be implemented and the legislature can't do anything about it for two years. That's the beauty of a ballot measure here in Washington state. They can't like overturn it or anything like that. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is forming a board. Whole Washington, that's the first thing we did was form a board and some of you already might be there. You might already have a board or not, but um, that's, it's very, very important to vet your board members really well. And you want to cut, I would recommend asking um, people who've been on the ground working for this in your state already, um, give them a seat at the table. They'll be more invested once um, the initiative is ready and you're ready to collect signatures. And a lot of um, organizations like unions, they have a lot of members. So if you get somebody in SEIU on the board or on a steering committee, they can maybe um, recruit some of their members to collect signatures when the time comes. Also unions have a bit of money, so you can also ask them to, to help you with fundraising. Um, steering committee, this is kind of a good way to vet some of your board members is create a steering committee, see how people interact on that. And then if they're great organizers and they're really on board, then you can put them on the board. Um, so, so the board is like, I'm getting a message from Cole about what the board and the steering committee, um, what their roles are. So the board is like the ultimate decision making group. They make decisions on, I, for the most part, on like, where you're going to spend your money. Um, campaign directors and field directors like Sean and I, we had a certain amount of leeway. We don't have to ask them like, okay, can we spend $100 on a banner or, you know, $50 on postcards or literature and that sort of thing. But like big expenditures, um, you want the board to kind of approve those. Also, the discussion of strategies and voting on discussion of strategies, like there's two different kinds of initiative processes here in Washington State, initiative to the people and initiative to the legislature. So that's something our board did discuss and vote on last year, what we were gonna do, whether it was gonna be an initiative to the people or legislature. So pretty big decisions that would affect the entire organization. That's what you have a board for. And the steering committee, I think can do more like just grassroots organizing. And also, like I said, it's a great way to vet board members. Um, you wanna make sure that people who get on your board are team players and they're not gonna, you know, <laughs> throw a wrench in things when you need things to run pretty smoothly on a campaign, um, especially one this important. Um, so articles of incorporations and bylaws, what I did with Whole Washington is I just kind of went to our Revolution National <laughs> and took their bylaws and articles of incorporation and then um, tweaked them to make sense for um, what we were doing with our campaign. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. I thought our Revolution National was a pretty well thought out, well formed organization. So that's what I went. And you're free to look at our um, articles of incorporation or bylaws to get those kind of ideas. I will say that one thing that I did change with our Revolution National to whole Washington is we don't endorse candidates. And I did that because I've seen so many organizations fall apart over internal infighting over who you're going to endorse. And it's just one candidate, you know, <laughs> and whether they win or lose, you want to be able to have that coalition and that organization survive each one of these election cycles. Also, it's really initiatives in Washington state don't, don't endorse candidates to begin with, but I just wanted to be sure that we wouldn't be having um, fights, board fights, or steering committee fights about one candidate or, or another. So that's that's one thing that I would definitely suggest is don't get into the um, endorsing of candidates. They can, however, endorse you, and that's what we encourage with Whole Washington. You can go to our website, wholewashington.org, 
and view all of our endorsers. And um, this, we do that for two reasons, that um, solicit endorsements from candidates for two reasons. One, it shows credibility. So when we have a candidate or elected official who is well known, has name recognition, and they endorse you, then that shows you're a legitimate organization and other people feel more comfortable working with you. And also, it, um, well, with, with the legislative candidates in particular, we ask them if they'll sponsor a bill when they endorse. So we have a list of candidates who are running for the state legislature who could co-sponsor our bill um, that we'll be able to call on in November when we, once we know who won and say, okay, yay, congratulations, you won. Now here's all the talking points about our bill. Um, you need to introduce it on this day. Here are the other co-sponsors. And one thing that I wanna do this year is um, ask somebody in the legislature to create a, a universal healthcare caucus. You know, they have a Medicare for all caucus um, federally. I want Washington State to you have a universal healthcare caucus here um, in Washington. So. I think that would be exciting. And then they can, we can encourage them and they can encourage each other to put pressure on people like the healthcare committee chairs I was, I was speaking about earlier. I think that having their peers in the, legislator, in the legislature um, kind of poking at them saying, we need to pass this bill would be a lot more um, influential than just the grassroots organization whole Washington constantly. Um, barraging them with phone calls or emails. So that's one thing we're doing legislatively. Okay, um, any questions so far about, okay, Michael? When you're forming the board, are you talking about just the ballot measure board or whole Washington board? So the, the way that it works, um, at least in Washington state, I'm not sure how it is. Um, in other states, but you have to create, you have to file with the Secretary of State as a campaign. So we're, we're whole Washington, we have a board. And then once we file the initiative, then we kind of reform as the initiative number. So I'll give an example of initiative 735. So the organization that wrote the initiative was called WAMEND, Washington Move to Amend. Um, and I got a notification. Okay, he made it in. Um, so once they wrote the initiative and they filed it, they got the number initiative 735. Then they rebranded as initiative 735, but the board was still WAMEND. Um, they just had a steering committee that was specific to 735. So um, different states might do different things differently, but that's the board will be the whole Washington board or whatever organization um, you're affiliated with, and then you need to get the number you want to create a website. Like we were initiative 1600 with whole Washington, so we had yes on 1600.org. And then we made t shirts that said yes on 1600 and banners that said yes on 1600 because nobody's going to really know what whole Washington is. They'll just remember the initiative number. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right, so I want to talk about technology. Oh, just one other question. Uh, oh, sure. Robert in San Francisco, um, in terms of, you know, labor organizations and uh, healthcare groups and community organizations, how many, you know, what, what does it look like in Washington in terms of support from those sectors at this point? <laughs> Yeah, you know, in 2018, I think we only had one union endorsement. Um, it's really difficult and I can get into the difficulties with unions. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that under coalition building and the challenges <laughs> with union leadership. The, the members are pretty much on board, um, universally on board with um, passing some sort of Medicare for all or universal health care bill. I've ran into some resistance with members, but mostly it's leadership and 
well, actually, I might as well just, just in case I forget it, I might as well just <laughs> talk about it right now. So um, the issue that I've run into with um, leadership and unions is that they are concerned that if we have Medicare for all or universal health care, that there will be less of a reason for people to sign up as members of the union, because that's one of the main things that they do for their membership is negotiate um, better health care plans. So that's the challenge. Um, whenever I run into that argument with um, a union, I always let them know that in countries with universal health care, they have stronger unions. So that's clearly not an issue. Um, they can negotiate for things like paid time off, um, maternity, maternity leave, um, better wages, things like that. They don't have to spend all their time negotiating for um, healthcare. Um, so, okay, let's talk about technology really quickly. Um, when we first started, we used a uh, web platform, database platform called Nation Builder. I will strongly recommend not using Nation Builder. And this is why, first of all, it's really expensive. And second, I can't even count the amount of times it went down. Um, and we wouldn't even be able to have access to our website. So um, one of the first things you want to build is a website and you want to build a website that people can um, put in their information so that you can collect their data. Um, and that's what we use now is WordPress and then the back end with the data collection is called Action Network. It's really inexpensive. Anytime somebody signs up, you can see that. And then you can email them through Action Network too. So it, you don't need to use like a third party software like MailChimp or um, Constant Contact. So you can get all of your organizing done in Action Network. It also allows you to um, create events where people can RSVP. Um, it's got a whole bunch of really, really cool tools like Letter writing campaigns, one of the things we're doing with Whole Washington is we have a letter writing campaign where somebody can just go to our website, enter their um, address, and it'll pull up whoever their representatives here are in Washington state. And they can just, with one click of a button, send an email to all three of their reps, their two house reps and their senator, that asks them to co-sponsor the Whole Washington Health Trust and why. So it's really streamlined, really easy for people to use. So those are the two things for a website that I strongly recommend, of course. We also want to talk about donation tools and social media. I recommend um, Act Blue because a lot of people have already gotten their credit card information stored in Act Blue. Um, so that's it's really easy for them to donate um, with one click. They don't have to re-enter their credit card information. Um, but you'll want to have like a backup because some people don't like Act Blue because they it's associated with the Democratic Party. So um, I would recommend finding another platform, another um, donation platform in addition to Act Blue, like Anadot is what Whole Washington uses. But you know there there are a lot of different um, donation tools. CrowdPack is another one that you can use. Um, and social media. Get all your social media accounts set up and try to use the same name. Like we have Facebook is Whole Washington, Twitter is Whole Washington, Instagram Whole Washington, TikTok Whole Washington. Although don't go to our TikTok because we have nothing there because <laughs> I haven't quite figured that one out yet. I, I really don't like taking videos. <laughs> So that kind of in, inhibits my ability to do TikTok. So we need to find somebody who, who can do that um, and well. Um, okay, any questions about technology? Um, what, what, uh, yeah, Georgia, what was the other one you said besides CrowdPack? What was it? Anadot, A-N-E-D-O-T. Oh, okay. And I'll make sure to put notes. I, I have a document with the agenda and I'll put some notes and I'll um, write down all the uh, technology tools that I'm recommending so that you have it later and I'll send that out using the email addresses that you put in the chat so that 
I know I talk really fast. <laughs> oh, and we are recording this as well. So um, if you want to go back and watch it later, if you um, miss something. So. Uh, I was also wondering, do you have an estimate of how much per year you spend on like Action Network, uh, ActBlue, and the other uh, WordPress? So WordPress is free. Um, Action Network, it depends on how many emails you send. So we, our standard bill from Action Network is about $15 per month, but we have gone up to like $100 when we are sending out a lot of emails. So, um, and then ActBlue is just a percentage of whatever donations you get. I think it's like one to 2% of your donations through ActBlue um, is what they charge you. So those tools are really inexpensive. Nation Builder was like hundreds of dollars per month. And um, so that's why we switched over to, to Action Network. And also it's so much more reliable. Any other questions about technology? And I would encourage you all to go to wholewashington.org and just kind of like poke around the website. Um, any one of the forms that you see, that those are all Action Network built forms. So we don't use like Google Forms. We use Action Network so that anytime somebody signs up through one of those forms, it's automatically in our database and we can track what they signed up to do, if they signed up to collect signatures, if they signed up to phone bank or text bank, that sort of thing. Yes, Michael? Uh, I, for one, would like an inside tour of Action Network and <clears throat> maybe others would also. So I just put that out as a request um, sometime. Sure, yeah, I, I would totally would love to do that. Um, in fact, I can do that on this call after we kind of get done with the overview. I can show you what the back end looks like and um, demonstrate like one of those letter writing campaigns. If, if you all are interested and you don't want to go to the debate <laughs> or watch the debate, um, I can do that later. Yes, Cole? What kinds of things do you post on your different social media channels? Yeah, so mo mainly we post like the endorsements. Um, that's the biggest thing that we post, but um, every once in a while I'll post an article. We've gotten like thousands of shares um, sometimes with an article that we post. I think the one that did the best was an article about like how many tens of thousands of people cross the border from US to Mexico every day to get um, cheaper prescription drugs or to go see um, a doctor in Mexico just because it's so much less expensive. I, mean, I don't even know how many thousands of shares that got. And what I usually do with Facebook is I just like copy maybe a paragraph, two to three lines of the article, post the two to three lines and then the article and that's it. Um, every once in a while I might make like some sort of this is I'll say, this is ridiculous. This is why we need to change the system and then post an article. But I feel like a lot of the times what's in the article says more than what I would say anyhow. So, and then Twitter, it's a lot of endorsements. I don't run the Twitter. Um, I'm not as comfortable with Twitter as I am with Facebook. So we have two people who usually tweet um, and they post articles. Um, they retweet other people who um, have big Twitter followings. So um, I'm not really that great with Twitter, like I said, but um, I think the endorsements are, are mainly what we put on social media. And the, the great thing about posting those endorsements, you can tag the candidate. And a lot of these candidates have a much bigger following <laughs> than um, a, an initiative campaign will. So when they retweet us, that helps us get you know more eyes on what we're doing okay any more technology questions social media all right so oh michael yeah um many of us are skittish about facebook because sort of um they're mining our data and <clears throat> are there a set of privacy checkoffs that you put on your facebook to protect yourself 
Um, no, I'm, I, I'm really bad with that. Actually, I most of my posts are public, um, especially my political ones. I I make those public um, so that they can be shared. Uh, but um, if it's like about my family, then I'll make it just friends only. Mm. However, you know, I'm mainly talking about like the whole Washington public Facebook page yeah. and okay. that you don't want to have any privacy settings on. Um, you want people okay. to be able to share it and see it. Thank you. No problem. All right. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Action Network already. But one of the main reasons why we want to have something like Action Network is because you want to collect people's data so that when you are ready to run your initiative campaign, you have a list of people who've signed up to volunteer already. With Whole Washington, what we've been doing is we've been asking people to pledge to collect signatures. I mentioned that earlier. We have hundreds of people who've already pledged to collect over 200,000 signatures. So once we do have the initiative filed, we have the petitions printed, we can just look at this list and start sending them petitions right to their doorstep. We can also text them. We can say, by the way, your, your initiative is in the mail. Please collect as many signatures as you can. Or we can say you, you signed up to collect 200 signatures because that's one of the things we ask for. How many signatures do you think you can collect? You signed up to collect 200 signatures. That means you should collect an average of X amount of signatures per week in order to make your goal. Um, and then, you know, in a few weeks after that, we can text them again. How are you doing? Have you collect, how many signatures have you collected them? You collected already. And we use actually through text. I forgot to mention that. Um, through text is the texting tool we use um, to text people. And it's eight cents per text. Um, not any text that you receive, but every text you send out, send out if you're responding to a text, it's eight cents per text. So that is probably the most expensive tool that we use with Whole Washington. It can get pretty pricey. <laughs> um, so we use it very sparingly and only when it's very important, um, which sending out the petitions will be very important. We'll use texting for that, um, letting people know or asking them, have you made your goal? If you've made your goal of 200 signatures, can we send you another petition? Um, that sort of thing. Um, another way to grow your database, other than um, you know, doing petitions or those letter writing campaigns through Action Network, is asking organizations to send out emails. So if you're part of DSA, um, you probably already have a database that you can ask, you know, maybe our revolution locally will send out an email about what your efforts are. And you can ask them to put a link to your website so somebody can, you know, oh, by the way, we're starting this initiative. Please sign up on this website um, to help out with this effort. And then, you know, once they fill out that form, then you have their data so that you can call them or text them. Um, when the time comes and also you're collecting their email address so you can send them updates and you can do donation asks. Um, so this is one thing that we can't do very much right now, although Sean's kind of found a way to continue volunteer recruitment through events. Um, due to COVID-19, there aren't any big events going on where we, we used to go with a volunteer sign up form that would have, you know, name, email address, uh, zip code, and then how many signatures will, are, will you be able to collect? That sort of thing. And then we had somebody who would enter that data for us. But because of COVID-19, there aren't big events. But what Sean Cavanaugh has been doing with um, some great volunteers around the state is holding sign waving parties where we socially distance. He put masks on, but there's signs, you know, ask me how to volunteer for whole Washington. And people stop by, they honk their horn, will stop by and they'll sign up to volunteer with Whole Washington. That's one thing that we've been doing. And also that's movement building in your state. It's getting word out about what you're trying to do and um, creating some attention for, for your efforts. Um, Georgia, one thing you can do when you're out there is uh, QR. Um, get a huge QR that people just point their phones at and it takes you to their website. 
that's a great idea. We should definitely start doing that, like printing those out on signs and sort that sort of thing, or on our literature. That's a really good idea. Um, so what that is, does anybody not know what a QR code is? Um, because if not, I can explain it. But it's basically something where you can point your phone at it, it'll scan, and then it can take you right to a website so you don't have to type anything in. Sometimes domain names can be really long, so it's very helpful to have that QR code. Um, okay, so any questions about database or volunteer recruitment? Um, yeah, uh, I was wondering, um, so would, would you, uh, when you would target big events and ask volunteers to go get signatures there, do you do that through Action Network? Like you just say email the volunteers in the zip code? Yeah, you can, um, so with Action Network, you can target people based on what form they filled out, um, where they are, their city, their zip code, the legislative district. So if we want to say, okay, this legislator really needs to be tar to needs to be called a lot or emailed a lot, you can ask people in that legislative district um, via email through Action Network uh, to contact their legislator. So really, it's it's great for um, uh, the other thing is you can target donors too. If somebody's donated like. $10. You can say, thank you so much for donating $10. Can you donate $20 now? Things like that. Um, it's just an amazing tool and it's great that it's so inexpensive to use. Yes, Michael? Do you have a survey form that you use with Action Network to collect all that information like a legislative district, congressional district, so forth? It does that automatically. It does? Zip, yeah, with the zip code. Wow. That's all you need is the zip code. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's a great tool. All right, any more questions about um, database and volunteer recruitment? And like I said, I can go um, give like a little tour of, of the back end of Action Network for anyone who's interested. Um, maybe we'll plan that for 555 so that people can see it and still make the debate. Okay, so um, I already talked a little bit about soliciting endorsements. That was on the agenda, but I think I covered that already. Um, we do that for elected officials. We do that for businesses. We ask businesses to endorse um, candidates, uh, organizations like Our Revolution, DSA, in, um, indivisible groups, all those um, are great when you get an, an endorsement from like League of Women Voters. League of Women Voters endorsed us in 2018 and they sent out emails. You know, they have a huge database already because lots of people are affiliated with League of Women Voters. There's a kind of a, a, a sort of a um, predisposition against um, ballot majors uh, psychologically. <coughs> sort of the, the meme is about no um, and you'll probably be right. So um, how do you counter that argument? Um, I haven't heard that before. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of these issues have like started state by state, um, like marriage equality, legalization of marijuana. Um, those are all issues that started state by state and the legalizing of marijuana was a ballot measure. So um, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. A lot of ballot measures pass every year here in Washington state. Um, so I, I do know that there are a lot of organizations that are a little scared of the initiative process um, because of what happened in Colorado, but Colorado had some unique issues um, because of their state laws. Um, one of which they are required in the um, ballot summary to put how much taxes will be increased in a decade, um, but they're not allowed to put how much money will save um, by by passing universal health care. So, Elaine, do you, do you remember how much in that first sentence it said the taxes were going to increase? 
Oh, you're muted. Right, let's see. 35 billion. But, you know. No, I are... think it was, I think it was 30 billion. Yeah. But we would have saved 35. Yeah, so they weren't able to say, you know, we would be spending 35 billion and only spending 30 billion under this new system. So we saved 5 billion. They weren't allowed to say that. So that's it's in big capital letters, the first line. Yeah, so that's a big issue to, to overcome. Fortunately, we don't have that problem in Washington state. I'm not sure if anybody else has that state law, but. Um, yeah, I think that was probably the main issue. Also, again, for-profit insurers and pharmaceutical companies flooded the state with bad information, um, which hopefully we can avoid um, by giving them so many more targets in 2021. So, but the, the point is that we have to do this because healthcare is a human right and this is, we need to keep fighting until we win. Um, using any strategy that we can. So, all right. One thing I would like to talk about that is really a big problem with initiatives is getting any sort of attention for the initiative. Everybody loves to talk about candidates. It drives me crazy <laughs> for the issues that I was talking about earlier. Um, a lot of the times they don't get elected, and even when they get elected, they have a huge amount of resistance to overcome to get something like universal health care passed through their legislatures and then signed by the governor. So it seems like an initiative would be an obvious thing for people to pay attention to and be involved with, but it's hard to get press, it's hard to get people to even talk too much about an initiative. So um, one thing that we've been doing is running candidates in Washington state. Um, we have three whole Washington, like, core members who are running for legislature right now, including myself. And guess what? As soon as I was a candidate, everybody wants to interview me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so I've been in the spokesman review. I've been on NPR. Um, I'm running radio ads. And you know what? Every time, every single time, I'm like, okay, I got to mention whole Washington and universal health care three times, at least three times when I get interviewed. So that's one way. Um, we have somebody in Grace Harbor who's also running for legislature and then somebody in like the Everett kind of northern Washington area. Um, and then we have a ton of people who've endorsed candidates who've endorsed whole Washington. So that's one strategy to use to get um, people to interview <laughs> your core volunteers, staff, and board member is have them run for um, an elected office. It's hard and it's not really that much fun, I can tell you sometimes. <laughs> I'm having one of those weeks where I'm like, what did I do? <sighs> but, you know, the we have been getting talked about a lot um, as a result. Our, our organization and our efforts have been mentioned often recently, which is the goal. Um, organizing events, as I was saying before, um, sign waving, doing Zoom meetings. When COVID-19 first was happening, we um, did healthcare happy hours twice a week where we call the governor, we would call our legislators, um, and we just check in with people, talk about healthcare, talk about how people are doing. Um, so that's one thing to do right now is to, to do a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, and candidate forums. Um, I've been participating in lots of candidate forums. We've been putting on candidate panels um, and really focusing on healthcare. So also sending press releases. And that's one of the things I wanna um, talk about when we do our email chain is maybe sending out a press release about our different organizations and what we're going to attempt to do in 2021 just to start getting people talking about um, this this great collaboration of groups across the country all right um that's my entire agenda i'll i would like you know, anybody wants to ask questions, um, get clarifications, and then I'll go ahead and 
and talk a little bit more about Action Network. Yeah, this is Robert. Um, just, you know, the situation in California is uh, we, we've got, we've, we've had a, diff, a, uh, a bill in the legislature a few years ago. It, it went down, it got blocked. Um, uh, now we have as governor Gavin Newsom who is at least rhetorically pro single payer and he appointed a commission to look into uh, developing components of a state system and at this point it's because of the COVID it's way behind schedule but you know, that sort of one thing that's going on in terms of developing a program, uh, or at least, you know, bits and pieces of one. Eventually, uh, grassroots activists are going to have to take uh, their own program and either put it into a bill for the legislature, which, like in your case, hasn't gone through in the last 20 years or put it on the ballot. Um, my, my sense is, you know, we're not gonna be ready till at the very earliest 2022 and possibly 2024 when there's a higher turnout. Um, so, um, the, and then and then the other concern is when running one of these campaigns, uh, the money. And I'm extremely concerned about having absolutely solid union support in order to have the money to, to mm -hmm. run a feasible campaign and, and having everybody on board. So I think, uh, you know, it's well worth the time to build the coalitions and get the public educated so that, uh, you know, Elaine can speak to this. I spoke to somebody from the Colorado campaign right after, you know, as a post-mortem discussion for a newsletter article I was writing. I talked to them for about half an hour and, uh, and the sense I got was that there wasn't enough time to really do the campaign. It was a one year campaign. Everybody put lots of energy into signature gathering to get it on the ballot. And then there wasn't enough uh, energy or money to really pull it over the finish line. So, uh, you know, I, th I think it, it makes sense to really take enough time to do the coalition building and the grassroots education to really make the people impervious to campaigns like, like you mentioned, we had with the drug campaign, uh, which was not even that substantial. It was just controlling prices on a limited number of drugs based on the VA uh, formulations for, for the prices and the drug companies spent in the neighborhood of $120 million to defeat it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, that's the minimum of opposition you're going to be <laughs> looking at in Washington when, yeah. when you throw in the insurance companies. So, uh, you know, my concern is I would love to do a joint, you know, multi-state thing at the same time, like you mentioned but I'm really concerned that there's adequate preparation in all the states so that everybody can get their ducks in a row uh, education-wise, money-wise, uh, coalition partners, and have an absolutely solid coalition that, that you know, isn't going to be divided and played off. I, I hear you. I hear you. We're, we're going to just... I'm, we're getting kind of close to the end here, and I want to be respectful of anybody who, who does want to watch the debate, um, and I want to show you Action Network. 
But uh, to address that point, I think we need to stop being afraid of not making it or losing. <laughs> we just need to keep fighting. Um, marriage equality didn't happen the first time, you know, they fought for it, they didn't get it. You know, civil rights, the first time they fought for it, they didn't get it. You just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and not be afraid to fail um, and get back up and keep trying because this is definitely a worthy fight. Like I said, with Initiative 735 and De-Escalate Washington, they took twice. Um, and that's good. That we might have to take three times to get on the ballot. We might get on the ballot and lose, but we got to keep fighting because this is definitely a worthwhile but just, fight. You know, just to be, you know, look at the history of other ballot measures that have gone through. You can, you can actually set yourself back by losing, you know, massively. And you, if you run three times, it'll take you a lot more years to, you know, to get to that point of losing and losing, you know. Elaine, do you want to take than, that one? I but, think Elaine wants to answer that. Well, is, is, I have a question too, is, oh, okay. Are you finding, I mean, I find now it's, is you talk to people, they know what you're talking about. Back in 2016, it was, you had to do this huge education. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious in Washington, if you find that, that there are more people. I mean, I think we could be in an event, put up a sign and people would come to us at this point because they know what we are. Yeah, I mean, I would go to events and I'd have people lined up to sign the ballot measure. I could put the sign, I, we have these, here, I'll show you. Oh, I don't know if you can see because of my background, but it's a, it says basically, I'm a volunteer, sign my petition to get universal health care. And I would put it in the window when I'm eating at a restaurant and people would come in to sign. Um, so that's one of the beautiful things about a ballot measure is you're doing education while you're collecting signatures. In order to get 300,000 signatures, you got to talk to a ton of people about the issue. So it is, it is a lot of education. That's why I love it. Um, and, and, you know, it's sometimes it's really demotivating for people to hear, A, we have to wait, or B, just call your representative. We wonder why young people don't get involved with issues very much. It's because a lot of the times it feels like you're just fighting people who have no interest in passing the bill in the legislature. Um, you're, you hear over and over, we can't do it that way. We have to do it differently. We've done that. We've been in this fight for decades. And you're like, well... <laughs> I really want to do something now, something tangible, and collecting a signature is very tangible, and I think that's why it appealed to so many young people here in Washington State, and we had a ton of very young volunteers um, who are still with us, um, helping us with our efforts, whether it's Medicare for All, because we support Medicare for All. We've been doing, you know, Medicare for All events, too, and we've been organizing around stuff in the legislature. So Elaine, why don't we hear from you and then I'll do a little brief action network thing. Well, I just like to point out that there are a lot of states that can't do this. Mm -hmm. You know, that we, this is real power. 